That was a good one. Y'all are paying attention and and awake this morning. Just waiting for this nap to come. Well, I'll try not to give you too good a one. We're going to continue our study and uh, the story of God and man. And we are going to deal with the subject of the Holy Spirit today. And our theme text is Luke 24, 49, which says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you have given us that power from on high. That you have poured out the Spirit upon us, Lord. I don't think we understand the significance of that, God. Because for us, that's always been a part of salvation. But we know that prior to the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, the Spirit was but a promise. And I pray, Father, that today we would understand the depth and significance of that promise. That you would help us to walk in the Spirit, Lord, as you have commanded us. And we just commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in our study of the covenants, that it has become evident that all of the biblical covenants, of all the biblical covenants, only the new covenant made provision for our overcoming our inherent sinfulness. Now, in the uh, announcement of the new covenant, God promised in Jeremiah and elsewhere, God promised to do a, a work in our hearts that would bring us into a state of righteousness. And this means, uh, uh, the means of accomplishing this was the giving of the Holy Spirit. And it's really a profound thing that if if looking back, or if you take yourself back to that time, which we've been trying to do is see things as they develop, uh, they walked not without the Spirit, but without the indwelling of the Spirit in the permanent sense. And so it was a, a tremendous promise that God would send His Spirit to do a work in His people. And today we're going to try to get something of an understanding of the purpose that the giving of the Spirit serves. And to do that, let's begin with establishing the context of our theme verse. So back to Luke 24, but this time we're going to start in verse 46. Then Jesus said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. So the context of Jesus is saying, uh, that things are being fulfilled. It was As it was written, the Christ suffered, died, was raised on the third day, and now the gospel is being proclaimed, repentance and remission of sins being preached in his name. And guess what? You're going to need some help to do that. <laughs> so wait in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Now, we saw previously that the proclamation of the gospel began almost immediately after Christ was resurrected. And that is the mission of the church, right? To go forth and make disciples, preaching the gospel. And so it's no surprise that in the context of Jesus declaring the necessity of that mission, he would remind them of the promise of the Father to send the Spirit. The implication is that the the Spirit would enable them to carry out the gospel mission. The Spirit is able to do this because of who he is. Uh, In our study on the deity of Christ, uh, the other night we, we did a little bit on the Trinity because that wasn't the focus, but you know you don't want to just leave it out there that Jesus is God without explaining the, the Trinity. And we looked a little bit at the, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit is indeed God, that's clear from Scripture, and is indeed a distinct person within the Godhead. Uh, and we kind of see this in Acts chapter 13, verse 2. It says, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, so He speaks, It's not just an impersonal force. It says, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So the Holy Spirit is an active person. We have a relationship with him in the sense that uh, we have a relationship with God and and the Son. And he is a member 
of the Godhead. And so he has all power. Uh, you know, he, he, he's, he, that's why it says in do with power from on high. He has all the attributes of God. So the same power that God has, the Father has, and that the Son has, he has. And so the Spirit is able to enable us to accomplish God's will and mission. Now after the Spirit was poured out, the ministry of the gospel began, as we already talked about. But today we're, we're going to, and, and last time I, I, I jumped right into the middle of Peter's sermon with the proclamation of the gospel. Today we're going to back up just a little bit to the beginning of that sermon. The context for the sermon of Peter in Acts chapter 2 is that Jesus has been crucified, buried, resurrected, and has now ascended to the right hand of the Father. And the disciples do just exactly what Jesus instructs them to do. They tarry in Jerusalem and wait. And then on the day of Pentecost, they, the Spirit comes. But let's go ahead and look then at our exposition. And the first thing we're going to see is the giving of the Spirit. And as I said, the Spirit is given as promised. Now, when did God promise the Spirit? Well, there's a number of passages, but one of them is Isaiah 44, verse 3. For I will pour water on him who is thirsty. Ah, Larry. <laughs> Where'd he go? He's not even here. But I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods in the dry ground. I'll pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. One of the reasons why we talk a lot about water in our, in our, in our songs is because of the metaphor of the spirit and the water. I will pour the, my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. So that's Isaiah 44, 3. That's a promise that God is going to do. And in Joel chapter 2, verse 28 says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. So there's any number of things that, uh, uh, any number of verses we could point to that indicate that God has given us this promise of, excuse me, I don't want to break my neck on this thing, uh, of the Spirit. And we need to understand this promise. So let's take a look then at Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 1, and the, the event in which the Spirit is poured out. It says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. So the Spirit is giving them utterance. That's, that's, this is key. This is a work of the Spirit. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when the sound, when this sound occurred, occurred the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speaking in his own language and there's a lot of debate over what the miracle is there did they speak in a in different languages or did people hear in different languages we're not getting into that then they were all amazed and marveled saying to one another look are not all these who speak Galileans and how is it that we that we hear each in our own language in which we were born Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and, and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. That's important. What are they doing? They're praising God. They're, they're declaring the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others, uh-oh, <laughs> others mocking said, they are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words, for these are not drunk as you suppose, since it is the only the third hour of the day. You know, as Peter didn't say, because we don't get drunk. <laughs> just an aside there. <laughs> he just said, because it's, it's just the, you know, uh, third, not even the third hour of the day. And, but this was what was spoken by the prophet Joel. So he's pointing back to the promise. 
And it shall come to pass in the days, in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, and on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven and above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a, an amazing passage. And he just goes on to preach then and accuses them of killing Jesus, the, the Messiah, and all that good stuff. And then, you know, uh, there's some results of that. Uh, people get saved. Now, a question arises concerning the content of Peter's quote from Joel 2, 28 through 32. If this was what was predicted by Joel, why is there no record of the things that he predicted taking place? And again, verses 19 through 20, it says, I will show you wonders in heaven and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Now, you might could say the, the darkness was on the land, but not much else. Uh, blood and fire and vapor of smoke and, and the moon and the blood, that apparently didn't happen. Some, some try to argue that it maybe did, uh, but there's no record of it. But notice it says, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Now, how can it be a true prophecy if not all of it was fulfilled? The answer lies in that statement regarding the timing. Notice, notice that, that, that this is before the great and awesome day of the Lord. This fits with Zechariah. Zechariah 12, 10 through 11 says, And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him. As one mourns for his only son, and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. And that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning at Hadad Ramon in the plain of Megiddo. So the, the point here is that this is an event that is, coincides with the return of Christ. When they see him whom they pierce, they look upon him. And so, obviously, these are end time events. The, 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 these events occur at the second coming. So... How can James, I mean, uh, 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 Peter say that, that Joel predicted this when some of these things don't seem to be coming to pass? Well, the prophecy does come to pass, but only partially. The fulfillment awaits the future, specifically when Israel is restored to the place of blessing. We see similar prophecies, uh, like when, when God prophesies the return of Israel from exile. And God says, when I bring you out of those nations, you're going to never be kicked out again. You're going to be in there forever. Amos chapter 9 verse 13 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes him who sows seed. In other words, you just can't even keep up with how the blessing. That's going to be nice. The mountains shall drip with sweet wine and, the, and all the hills shall flow with it. I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. I will plant them in their land, and no longer shall they be pulled up from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. Now this is prior to the Babylonian exile. They were exiled to Babylon for 70 years, cast out of the land, and then in fulfillment of prophecy, God restored them to the land. But they got kicked out again. And at 70 A.D., they were scattered among the nations. And very few Jews remained after 70 A.D. And over time, even fewer Jews remained until there was just a little tiny remnant left. Most Jews were scattered throughout and lived for, you know, 2,000 years in these other areas, I mean, there's communities in, in Iraq that go back to, to the time of Jesus or before even, time of the Babylonian exile. So 
uh, God once again drove them out. So the, the prophecy was not uh, completely fulfilled when God brought the Babylonian, the, the, the exiles back from Babylon. When he restored them, it was a partial fulfillment of God's promise that he gave in Deuteronomy. If I, if I send you out, I'm going to bring you back, and I'm going to bring you back and keep you forever. So that was a partial fulfillment. In the same way, jo uh, Peter is pointing to Joel, but it's only a partial fulfillment. There's more yet to come. But that begs the question, well, what is this partial fulfillment? What is going on with this, this outpouring of the Spirit? So let's take a look now at the ministry of the Spirit. And the first thing that we notice, and this probably exists before, yeah, it definitely exists before the outpouring of the Spirit, but still a ministry of the Holy Spirit, and that is a ministry to unbelievers. Because one of the main things that the Spirit does is convict people of sin. John chapter 16, verses 7 through 11 says, Jesus says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. If I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Well, now I guess this is related more to his coming. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more of judgment because the rule of this world is judged. So one of the main roles of the Spirit is to convict people of sin. You know why? Because we're not convicted on our own. <laughs> I mean, you know, who wants to feel guilty? Who in here likes feeling guilty? There's a couple probably. Some people heap guilt upon themselves and just waller in it. It's just a form of self-pity. But most of us don't really want to feel guilty. We want to avoid guilt at all costs. And so we flee from God because, you know, we don't want God, you know, convicting us and telling us we're wrong. And we see that in the ministry, this ministry of the Spirit in the preaching of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. And then starting in verse 51, it says, Stephen is preaching to him. It says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hardened ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. Now when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart or made angry in their hearts, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. So the Holy Spirit attends his preaching to the point that they are being convicted of their sin, but their response is unlike the first group in Acts chapter 2 where, you know, that response was, oh, men and brethren, what should we do? And 3,000 people got saved. This response is, what are we going to do about this? Let's kill him. And they stoned Stephen to, to silence his voice to stop the conviction. Don't do that. Don't do that. It's so easy to try to silence God's voice when you're being convicted. It'll cost you. That will cost you. And even as a Christian, I did that, and it cost me two years of misery, dark night of the soul, because I silenced God's voice. And God said, oh, you don't want to listen? I won't speak for a couple of years. See how you like that. I did not like that, and you will not either. Believe me. Don't silence the conviction of the Spirit. When God brings conviction, receive it. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit, to change you and transform you and to bring you into repentance so that you can confess your sins, acknowledge Him, and receive salvation. Sometimes that sin is judgment of God. And that's really hard, isn't it? When, God, when you're trying to judge God and God's judging you, you get in a war with God, you know? I, I mean, I don't know about y'all, but, uh, well, I do know about y'all. You've all judged God, too. We've all judged God, thinking he's done it the wrong way, not sure that he knows what he's doing, you know, looking at our own suffering or the suffering of others, looking at our own, you know, the, the issues in life and just saying, well, 
you know, if God loved me or if God was good or if I, any of that kind of stuff. We've all done that. And God is judging us and saying, okay, you think I've got evil in my heart? In my, in my being? Let's talk about the evil in your heart. What have you done about that? You're going to judge me? That's what he told Job. You're going to judge me? <laughs> Let's talk about you for a second, Job. Don't resist God's convicting work. Because the other thing for unbelievers is not just conviction, but judgment. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 20. This is an interesting verse. This is a, this is a section on the gift of tongues. And Paul is trying to instruct the Corinthians on the proper purpose and use of tongues. And he says, brethren, do not, and by the way, tongues is a gift of the Spirit. That's why it applies to here, okay? He says, brethren, do not be children in understanding, however in malice be babes, but in, under, but in, but in understanding be mature. And the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips I will speak to this people. And yet, for all that, they will not hear me, says the Lord. Therefore, tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophecy is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. Does that make sense to you? Tongues are for a sign for unbelievers. And prophecy is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. All right? Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, will they not say that you're out of your mind? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, he is convicted by all, and thus the secrets of his heart are revealed, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. Did y'all see the switch there? Who, who are tongues assigned for? Well, then why is it that unbelievers, when they walk in and you're speaking in tongues, that Paul says they'll think you're crazy? Isn't it a sign for them? And he said that prophecy is not for believers, but if you prophesy and an unbeliever, I mean, yeah, not for believers, and an unbeliever comes in, guess what? He's going to get convicted in his heart, and he's going to hear the word of God, and he's going to repent and say there's a God among you. Paul just contradicted himself, right? Wrong. Sure looks like it. Sure looks like it. Well, how do we explain that? Tongues are for unbelievers and prophecy is for believers, yet if an unbeliever comes in and you're speaking in tongues, they'll think you're crazy. So tongues isn't functioning for an unbeliever, is it? Unless you get the point of what tongues are actually a accomplishing for an unbeliever and what prophecy is accomplishing for an unbeliever because what he says then is he doesn't say if a believer comes in you're prophesying he'll he says unbeliever in both cases he says if an unbeliever comes into your midst or one who's uninformed this is what's going to happen if you're speaking in tongues they'll think you're crazy if you're prophesying they'll be convicted in their hearts and repent so what's his point well, think about what tongues is for. What has he already told us it's a sign of? What's it, what's it a sign of for unbelievers? Is it a sign that God is with you and, and now you've spoken to this tongue and they've believed and they get saved? Is it that kind of sign? Kind of when Jesus performed miracles and people believed and got saved? No. What did he say? In the law is written, with men of other tongues and other lips I will speak to this people, and yet for all that they will not hear. It's a sign of judgment. In other words, when God, when, when God poured out the Spirit on those people, uh, the, the apostles standing there, and the Spirit gave them utterance. This, yes, they were praising God and they were blessing God and rejoicing in God. And it's a beautiful, wonderful thing. But it is also at the same time a judgment on Israel. Because Israel had, had crucified her Messiah. Israel had rejected Jesus. And so just like when Jesus comes along and he's teaching and, and he's telling people everything and he's casting out demons and they say, oh, you do that by the devil. Okay, I'm not going to speak to you intelligibly anymore. I'm going to speak to you in parables. I'm going to hide it from you. 
Because you don't want to hear, I'm going to let you be blind to the truth. Because you don't want to listen, I'm not even going to speak intelligibly, intelligibly to you. I'm going, to, I'm going to hide it in parables. In fact, it gets so bad, I'm going to speak to you in another language that you don't even understand because that's your judgment. Because you rejected Messiah. And, uh, and I get a, a, a message on Facebook. Does your church, is your church spirit, or, uh, yeah, spirit filled and do they speak in tongues? Well, you know what? Uh, we are spirit filled. And I don't know. Some claim to speak in tongues here and some claim that tongues is gone and, and we're not going to get into that debate. But you know what? We ain't speaking it in church and let me tell you why. What Paul is pointing at is this judgment. And, and notice what happens in Acts chapter 2 when the tongues are poured out. It says, they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? I can hear in my own language. But others, mocking, said they are full of new wine. Their hearts were right then and there condemned by their own choice. I mean, they, they condemned themselves, mocking, and so they could not receive from God what God was doing. For some, it's an obvious miracle, but for others, it's a reason for mockery. And, and God makes it clear to them that this event is a sign of judgment on those who rejected him. God wouldn't even speak intelligibly to them. But for those who were ready to repent, it was a marvelous miracle. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. So what's happening when someone is given a gift of tongues? They are praising God. They are rejoicing and declaring the, the, the works of God. And they themselves may be edified in that. Paul says so in, in 1 Corinthians 14. They may build themselves up in that. But they are, the tongues are for judgment. So Paul says, I thank my God, in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 18, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in all the church I'd rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Because when, when people... It, and, and this is not a debate over whether tongues exist today or not. That's not the point. The point is that tongues were meant as a judgment of the speaker of the spirit on those who were rejecting him to hide the truth from them because they already chose to hide it from themselves. And so if we get up in church and begin speaking in tongues, who's the object of judgment? Uh, are, we, are we being a sign to somebody in here? You may be blessing yourself. According to Paul, that's, that's a very fine thing to do because you're praising God, but you're not blessing the rest of the church because it's being used inappropriately. So Paul said, I speak in tongues more than all of you, but not in church, not in the assembly. Now, I would imagine he probably did it when he was being stoned. <laughs> you know, and I don't mean the... <laughs> And when he's being hit with rocks, he's probably doing it when he's being cast out of the synagogues as a sign of judgment on Israel. And so, if you wonder why we are a church that does not engage in tongues in the assembly, it's because we understand the purpose. The purpose of tongues was to be an announcement of judgment Now, it's between you and God if you believe that tongues is extant for today and you want to practice tongues at home and you, you, know, you want to be engaged in that. That's between you and God and your conviction. Uh, we, you know, there's lots of different interpretations about whether or not tongues exist today or it's, just, you know, it's ceased and all that. Uh, all of that to me is irrelevant to this issue, why we don't do it in church. We do believe in the Spirit. We believe in the Spirit is outpoured. We believe that the Spirit has a ministry to believers. 
We believe that, that it goes beyond just conviction and judgment. It actually is the promise of God. We believe that the Spirit also brings conviction to the unbeliever to bring him to Christ, to bring him to salvation. And the ministry then begins with conviction, but it goes far beyond that. It, it also in, uh, uh, entails inspiration and illumination. The, the Holy Word is inspired by God, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. That it's in, God breathed so that we could know that this book comes from God. That it is His Word to us, telling us the truth and, and leading us into the truth. But our, our minds are darkened by sin. How many of y'all have ever struggled with the Bible and then one day just something clicks and you go, oh wow, that's just, I, I've never seen that before. And just all of a sudden, it's an illumination of the Holy Spirit. That's the work of the Spirit in your life to bring you to an understanding. That's the gift that God promised. See, the Spirit is to lead us into all truth, John 16, 13. But there is something more profound than all of that in my opinion. I mean, that's, that's all necessary and essential because if you don't know the truth, you can't believe the truth. And if your mind is darkened against God, you're, you're not going to believe the truth. So you need to be illuminated. But then there's another aspect of this, and this is the essence of the promise. Regeneration. It's the most important aspect of the ministry of the Spirit. Titus 3, chapter, four, uh, chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. See, regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. It's the means by which God gives us a new heart. It's the essence of the promise of the Spirit in the Old Testament. Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19 through 20. Then I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within them, and take the stony heart out of their flesh, and give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Salvation is about spiritual transformation, regeneration, born again, you can't convince me you're born again if you're the exact same person you've always been. You can't convince me. You may convince God because God knows and I don't, but you can't. I'm like, you know, James, you know, show me your faith without works. <laughs> Whatever. I, I hope you make it, brother. <laughs> I hope that day that you get in, uh, but you haven't convinced Joel James. He's, he's skeptics when he looks at people and they don't, they're not living right. He's a skeptic. You know, you want to convince me that you're, that you're saved and yet there's no change in your life since the day you were born again, you had new life? I'm not buying it. There is spiritual transformation that comes with the Spirit. There's something that's going to change in you. Now, it may be subtle and you may stay an immature believer, that's possible, but there's something is going to change. It's not just regeneration, it's sanctification of the Spirit, being set apart for God. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. So you're sanctified by the Spirit, set apart for God. The Spirit is also a seal and pledge from God. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So the Spirit is God's pledge of inheritance for you. If you receive the Spirit, you're saved. That's your seal. Seal until the day of redemption. You know, but from God's perspective, my perspective, I might still think you're just a, <laughs> I might not know. I don't know if any of y'all are saved, quite honestly. I only know me. Well, uh, you could be putting on some airs. So it's up to you to know whether or not 
You have the Spirit. That is up to you. Nobody's going to figure that out for you. You have to know. Well, there are other things in the ministry of the Spirit, and, and I would like to go in, in, in depth on this, but we don't have time to, to do that deep of a study on the, on the ministries of the Spirit. But it includes such things as the gifts of the Spirit, uh, being baptized into Christ, you know, a permanent dwelling, all those things. But how do you know that you have the Spirit? Well, interestingly enough, God said there's some signs, some ways of knowing the manifestation of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4 through 7, and Paul in, in 12, 13, and 14 in 1 Corinthians is dealing with this conundrum because there are people engaged in all kinds of spiritual activities that, and he said, you're, you know, y'all have all the gifts, but they were abusive with them. They were abusive with a lot of things in, in Corinth, but they were abusive with the gifts, and so Paul is trying to bring that under control, and one of the things he did was show that tongues is a sign of judgment, so why are you using it in the church? You don't need to do that, uh, but he said, and, and, and it's not that tongues could never be used in the church. It's not that you sin, but that's just kind of not the purpose of it. You know, he did say that if there's an interpreter, you could use tongues in the church. Uh, but the point being that there, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4 through 7, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all. By the way, one of the st Wednesday night studies that I'm working on will be a complete study of the gifts of the Holy Spirit and all of that so we can try to get an understanding of what that's all about. Because I know there's a lot of confusion out there about what, what that's all about, whether or not the, ex the gifts exist today and, and all that kind of stuff. We'll, I'll be working on that. It may take a while before we do that study, but, but that's on the horizon at some point. So, notice the Trinitarian formula. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversity of activities, but it's the same God who works in all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit. So, there's a specific aspect of those gifts given by the Spirit to each one for the profit of all. And they are designed to manifest or reveal the Spirit. And those are all the ones that that you think of as spiritual gifts of these days as healing and word of wisdom and all those kind of things, uh, you know, uh, uh, prophecy, working miracles, speaking in tongues. All of these were manifestations that the Spirit was present. And they were given to make Israel know that the, that the Spirit had been given, that they might realize that they'd been left out of the promise, that, that they could see, wow, the Spirit is there, and, and I'm not involved in that. I need to, to repent and get involved in that and, and, you know, and be a part of where the Spirit is outpoured. So a lot of that was to reveal that the, that the church, which we'll get to next in our next study, that the church was the recipient of the Spirit. But you know, a lot of that can be faked, and God knows that. God knows that. In fact, when, when Moses went in to, to you know, deliver Israel and he performed his miracles, what happened the first few times? Yeah, the magicians did the same thing. They faked it or they had some demonic powers or whatever, we don't know. But they did the same thing. You know, I've been in a church where I witnessed someone speaking in tongues and it was done proper and in good order. I can't tell you if it's tongues because I don't know what language it, they thought it was being spoken. So I can't judge as to whether or not it was real or not. But it was done right. And I've been in churches fake. When you watch Kenneth Copeland, is it Kenneth Copeland? And Kenneth Hagen, and they're dueling banjos, tongues, speaking to each other. It's fake. Kenneth Hagen wrote a book. How to teach someone to speak in tongues. Just start wagging your tongue and uttering syllables and the Spirit will take over. That's not a gift from the Spirit. At, at, at best, that's just psychological. At worst, it's the devil. 
People can fake that stuff, guys. And, and so it can be a, a source of confusion. Don't look for those kinds of signs. If God does that in your life, you know, if there's some things going on, I have some very profound experiences that are supernatural in my life that I know that go beyond human nature, go beyond human wisdom, go beyond all that. I know that God was at work doing something spiritual. I'm not going to get into all that. Uh, you know, they're interesting, they're fun. But you know what's more important? Not the signs of the Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. In fact, that's exactly what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. And, and remember, 12 is all about all the, 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 the signs and stuff you all having trouble with. But I, in verse 13, uh, chapter 13 says, I show you a more excellent way. And he starts talking about love. So I can have all those gifts and all that stuff, but if I do not have love, I'm nothing. And so if you really want to know, you really want to understand the Spirit, you know, yes, if, if God's still doing some of the things that, that you, you, know, you think He's still speaking in tongues and all that, great, that's fine. Focus on the fruit first. When you have the fruit of the Spirit, you'll know you have the Spirit. When you see inner transformation in your life that you know that you could not have created. That you know that you're a different person than you ever were before. That, that you literally have been born again. When you know that, you know you have the Spirit. So seek the fruit of the Spirit and you'll understand. You'll, have the, you'll see who the Spirit is. You'll, you'll know. You'll have the manifestation of the Spirit, even in your own life. Well, how do we apply this? Well, the first thing we need to do Guys, if you haven't done this, is receive the Spirit. That's the whole point of salvation, of the, of the new covenant salvation. John 7, 37 through 39 says, On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood, out and stood, stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. Thirst. You know what it's like to be thirsty? You know what it's like to... Just really be thirsty. You pray, You want something so bad. You've got to have that water so bad. If anyone thirsts, you're deeply longing for something that you don't even understand what it is. Jesus says, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. You'll never be thirsty again. And not only that, well, you never be thirsty again. You'll be a source of water for all those around you. Water poured out so others may drink deeply of the Spirit. It says, but this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because he was not yet glorified. So receive the Spirit. Receive it by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ Believing in his death, believing in his resurrection, asking him for, to forgive you, giving your heart to him to be your Lord and Savior, confessing your sins, acknowledging that your sins. You, you can't commit to do better. You can't commit to never sin again. That's nonsense. You've got to get saved from your inability to, uh, to overcome sin. That's the whole purpose of the gift of the Spirit. But it takes confession and acknowledgement of your sin. And then... Once you have the Spirit, walk in it. Oh, novel idea, right? God gave you the gift of the Spirit for a reason. Not for you to ignore. Not for you to neglect. Galatians 5.16, I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Still got a lot of sin problems in your life? Maybe you're not walking in the Spirit. At least in that area. You may walk in the Spirit in some areas, but... You're not fully walking in the Spirit. And then finally, be filled with the Spirit. And I think this is going to surprise you. How do you get filled with the Spirit? That's how you receive the Spirit. That's how you get baptized in the Spirit. But this Greek word, be filled with the Spirit, it says in Ephesians chapter 5, 18, and do not be drunk with wine, in which, is dis in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. It's in a verb tense that means be continually. 
This is not a one-time event. This is something that goes on all the time to be filled with the Spirit. And then notice what it says right after that. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. You know what that says to me? If you want to be filled with the Spirit, sing some songs. Somebody's filled the Spirit back there. <laughs> the Spirit of something. If you want to be filled with the Spirit, celebrate your salvation in your heart. Rejoice in your God. The Spirit will fill you and enable you. And you will be able to walk and yield to the Spirit even more, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. The most musically incapable human being that I ever had the privilege of meeting was my mentor, Dr. Norman Geisler. He's dead now, so he won't get, <laughs> he hears it, but he don't care now. So I could not sit by him in church because he can't clap to a beat and he can't keep a tune. And I am not musically gifted, so if you're not on, I'm not on. Now, I've got to have a lead. I can sing with you, I can clap with you most of the time. But I can't do it if you're not on. Or if you're doing harmonies, i got to get away from you. Because I, I can't follow that either. I can only do the melody. So, Dr. Geisler whew, his daughter committed suicide. <laughs> i got to take a second. <laughs> while I was in seminary. And he gave a chapel service not too long after that. And he said, you know, I don't know how you people that, that always have the new songs, constant new songs and never sing the hymns and stuff. He said, I don't know how you do it, how you make it through anything if you don't know a song to sing. He said, the way I got through this is laying in my bed at night. I just sung hymns to myself. He couldn't make a melody with his mouth or his hands, but he could make a melody with his heart. And he sung those hymns to God just to make it through the night. And he was filled with the Spirit so that he could endure the tragedies of life. So let's sing our songs. Let's rejoice. Let's build ourselves up in the Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and we thank you that you have given us the Spirit. That you have poured the Spirit out, Lord. And that by faith we have received the gift from you. When we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. When we, we believed in his death for our sins. We confessed our sins to you. Acknowledged that we needed that death to save us. And we believed on the resurrection we confess our sins and ask you forgiveness, Lord, and you gave us the gift that surpasses our understanding, and that is the, the Holy Spirit, Lord, to indwell our hearts and seal us forever. Lord, I pray that we would indeed be filled with the Spirit as we walk in the Spirit, Lord, having received the Spirit, so that we might rejoice in the good times and prevail in the bad. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.